Hello. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we're here to talk about the future of blockchain gaming. So quick show of hands. Does anyone in here consider themselves a gamer? Maybe you've heard of CryptoKitties or you play Fortnite. OK, great. Um, so we're 10 years into this blockchain industry as of January 3rd. And there's been billions of dollars of investment. There's been a ton of hype. Uh, but so far, there's really not that much real-world usage. And I personally believe that gaming is going to be a huge part of the next wave of mainstream adoption. So I've brought together here a panelist of um, traditional gaming industry veterans to talk about what the future is going to be like. And on my right, we have Randy Saif. Saf. 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 <laughs> uh, CEO of LucidSight. We have James Mayo. CEO of Eight Circuit Studios, and Christian Gonzalez, CEO of Migo. So I want to let you guys kick it off with about you know, 90 seconds or so. Just give a quick background on yourself and your company. Sure. Uh, my name is Randy Saf. Um, I uh, run Lucid Sight. Uh, we make the, uh, the app game MLB Crypto Baseball. It's officially licensed game uh, with the Major League Baseball. Uh, go Dodgers. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, we did the uh, 40,000 uh, NFT giveaway at Dodger Stadium a while back. Maybe some of you heard about. Uh, before that, I had an iPhone gaming company. We were actually a launch partner with the, uh, the App Store in 2008. Uh, so I had the, the, you know, the blessing of picking the right horse uh, with Apple. Uh, we had 14 of the first 100 free iPhone apps. Uh, so huge land grab. Uh, this was when... Free apps were not trendy. Uh, everybody else had paid apps. Apple wanted everybody to do paid apps. Uh, we made the controversial at the time decision to make it free uh, with no real good business model apart from advertising. Uh, eventually, that became the uh, large ad network Ad Colony, uh, which is the second largest mobile video ad network to Google uh, today. Um, and that was sold a couple years back to Opera Media Works. So anyways, we, we started Lucid Sight kind of on the idea of doing frontier gaming again. Uh, because, you know, we have the benefit of, uh, you know, previous success. We could go into, you know, AAA PlayStation games. We could stay in the iPhone space, which is our gargantuan space, iPhone, Android. iPhone's doing about $70 billion a year in uh, in-app uh, purchases, and Android's doing another $40, $50 billion. Uh, makes crypto look small. Uh, and, uh, and that's annual revenue, and it has a tailwind. Uh, it's, it's probably, in my, my belief, it's the most important part of the Apple business. Um, but it's a gargantuan industry at this point. We decided we go into it, we should go into an industry where we could see the entire playing field again, uh, where the rules are being rewritten, uh, and that seemed really interesting. And that's what led us to blockchain gaming. Hey everybody, my name's uh, James Mayo, and uh, of Eight Circuit Studios. Uh, we come from the game industry, so my background is as a producer. Uh, started at Nintendo in the 90s, uh, went over to Microsoft for a number of years as they transitioned from their PC um, uh, games group into the Xbox group. And uh, we, we, over the last, I don't know, a couple of years, um, we're really trying to figure out how to get people onto blockchains because we just saw this tremendous value that they were offering, um, primarily in the ability to uh, create a system where you had uh, effectively trustless trust where you didn't actually have to depend on another person or another institution to trust um, these transactions. And so we felt like games would be the best way to bring people in and games is typically solving a lot of the heavy lifting problems that you'll see with user experience, solving a lot of technical issues and generally speaking, gamers or people who are sort of oriented around games really love driving new technologies forward to give them the best possible gaming experiences. So we thought we could bring some of our experiences, um, AAA developers, uh, into the blockchain space. And so uh, we have a game out called Alien Arsenal, uh, Battle for the Blockchain. That's our casual game, uh, currently in the App Store and the Google Play Store. Uh, and then we're working on uh, as close to AAA as we can get with a new product coming out called Project Genesis, uh, first-person shooter. And we're trying to implement as much of um, the, 
the Destiny experiences we can get. So that's a AAA game um, that's uh, currently out. So uh, that's our background. Hi, I'm Christian, and I work for this company called Migo Games, <coughs> and we make a blockchain game that is a trade uh, trading card game. Um, the reason we do this is I personally and my, my co-workers were all trading card game fans since we were kids when they were physical, and <coughs> in the transition to digital trading card games, uh, we feel that uh, they're not, uh, th they became worse because they're, you cannot trade the hard, a Hearthstone card, for example, or any modern digital trading card game. So how come in a trading card game you cannot trade cards? So that's how we started with a uh, frustration. And uh, now we design a very good trading card game called Darkwind. Uh, it's a pirate themed, uh, which is inspired by uh, Magic the Gathering and Hearthstone, but with also very innovative uh, game mechanics and rules that I think you will find uh, very uh, fun. And uh, we, and well, uh, our company started with iPhone games too, and we also are in the process of building an MMO which uses uh, blockchain, uh, specifically Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a project that it's gonna take a lot more longer. Uh, and while we do that, we decided that we wanna do something smaller and we started making dark ones. Thanks guys. Uh, and my name's Chris. I work at a company called Token Foundry, which is part of Consensus. Uh, we help companies design and market and launch compliant utility tokens and soon-to-be security token sales. And I'm also working on some internal gaming initiatives uh, within Consensus that have uh, yet to be announced. But you know, before we get to the future of blockchain gaming, let's talk about kind of what's going on right now. Um, it's been about a year since CryptoKitties you know, first came on the scene. I think it had 10,000 users at the peak. It kind of proved out this concept of non-fungibility and non-fungible tokens. Um, but really, there's not a lot of usage, right? Most of the users have kind of left, and, and there's just not a lot of depth in a lot of these games. So what's going on right now? What, what are these games doing right? What are they doing wrong? Um, Randy. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's the old saying, uh, history rhymes, it doesn't repeat. Um, you know, I think that when you look at CryptoKitties, that's, that's not a reproducible business model uh, in the sense that they, you know, they got lightning in a bottle, it went viral. Uh, got a lot of attention on a lot of non-crypto uh, people got excited about the game, played it. Uh, it's definitely has lost a lot of its uh, users since its peak. Um, but you look at the iPhone space and, and uh, back in 2008, again, that's going by my own knowledge, my, my own experiences, and you saw the same thing in the iPhone space, that there were games that at the time were genre-defining uh, that just didn't last the, the test of time. Uh, we had a marble game where you tilted your iPhone and rolled a marble around the, the screen, went through a labyrinth, I think it was called Labyrinth, um, and it you know, had tons of downloads, and people were like, wow, this is like, and the Wii was popular, you guys remember the Wii, the first Wii, not the Wii U, but uh, you know, people thought that was the future of gaming, was swinging the iPhone around and tilting it, and you know, like we had a, we had a baseball pitching game we were thinking about with the iPhone, and using the accelerometer, and so you, know, you have these, these, uh, these things that come out, and it really wasn't till Angry Birds came out, um, and you know, I'll, I'll, look, I'll be the first to admit, our games were not genre-defining. You know, we had early games, we had a ton of users because they were free, but Angry Birds was like the first game that really was like, wow, that's what a very good iPhone game looked like. It didn't use the accelerometer, had a nice uh, use of the snapping feature of the, of the screen. You could play it, you could get in and out of it quickly. Uh, and even that one wasn't what really ended up being the big money makers on the iPhone being like Candy Crush and Clash of Clans and, and those, those style of games. So, so I think we're kind of at that phase if you look at it. Like we're probably pre-Angry Birds still. Um, but uh, there's a lot of companies that are experimenting and we just won't know it till we see it. There will be a lot of hindsight bias where we'll be like, oh, I always knew what a good iPhone game would look like. I mean, trust me, in 2008 people had no idea what a good iPhone game would look like, um, so. Yeah, and I think to echo that, like, um, 
what you'll see, especially with uh, engineers like us, and we're really focused on the technology or the first couple of use cases. So we try and wedge the in, in you know in our case it would be something like a game, right? You're wedging the game into the technology as opposed to really getting back to the fundamentals of game design. And I think that's one of the things that you're seeing is everybody went into uh, the, the development looking at DApps, right? It's how do you get um, scripts running on the blockchain. And there's some really cool stuff that you can do with it. But I think if you, you shift, like in, the, in game design, you have sort of these different layers of places that you put data. And so one of them is going to be like, as you guys would know, you know, you put data in the graphics card, and so that's going to run the graphics, and you want a certain amount of data in the processor, a lot of it. Uh, some's going to go onto the hard drive, and it's the same thing with blockchains. You have to figure out how this data model works, and once you do, you use it appropriately. And so, I think what you're going to start seeing is people who are going to focus more. You're hearing about hybrid games. It's one of the areas that we're we're playing with right now, which is you spend all the time and energy on game design and then just touch the blockchain for what it's really good at. Uh, and there's a couple of things that I think you'll see that the blockchain is great for and that users are really willing to endure a lot of pain for and it gets down to like, you know, transaction fees. A lot of people complain about it and then this volatility uh, that you'll experience in blockchains, it's another sore point. But if you create the experience for the gamer in such a way that it makes that pain worth it, um, I think you'll find that a lot of people are going to start opening up game design and development using blockchains for spe very specific reasons. So that, that leads me to my next question. Uh, did you want to add anything? Um, no, let's go through it. So um, for the game developers, let's put like two buckets, the actual game developers and the end user, the gamers. You know, what, are the, what are the benefits if you're coming from the point of view of the game developer, and then the flip side is, you know, as a gamer, why would you care about these blockchain features being layered into the game? Yeah, I mean, so the, you know, we're, you know, different companies are coming at this from different angles. Most of the blockchain gaming companies are blockchain people who are super excited about blockchains and, and uh, dApps, and they're just getting into gaming. We're a game studio who got into blockchain uh, because of the, the qualities it can add to a game. Uh, but I have, a, I have a sort of a strong belief kind of echoing what, what, what was said over there is that you're either going to get a really crappy game that's super blockchain heavy or a fun game that has features of the blockchain. Um, the features of the blockchain that can add something to gaming are true digital ownership and, be able to, and, and, and along those lines the ability to sell the stuff you own. Uh, if you look at uh, the software license, in a lot of ways I look at it as a bit of a historical accident where, that we ended up where we're at. So you look at back at the 70s and 80s when Microsoft first was selling Windows on a bunch of floppy disks. They didn't want General Electric installing Windows on 100 computers at, at their office, so they sold it as a license. This software licensing model has perpetuated, and it's now been over 30 years that consumers have become intuitively uh, 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 you know, knowledgeable about not owning software. Uh, if I give you an MP3, I have the MP3, nobody cares who has the original MP3. Same thing with JPEGs, or same thing with, with other types of, uh, of media formats. If I give you my Bitcoin, I don't have my Bitcoin anymore. You know, I'm sad I don't have my Bitcoin. So in the same way, the software license, uh, you know, in ability of the, of the publisher trying to maintain real in control, it's, pr it's continued on. So now today, you know, when you have your iPhone, you own the glass, you own the metal, you own all the electronics of the iPhone, but you have a license to use iOS. And it's not only just a license, it's kind of a crappy license to a consumer because they can update it and change it every six months. And if you don't agree to it, you can't even use your phone anymore. So for the first time in history, blockchain creates the opportunity for true digital ownership. Now you say, well, like, again, consumers don't have an intuition around this, so they're not really demanding this at this moment. But you take it to another uh, aspect of their life, like their car. If I told somebody, hey, you own that car, but you can't change the paint color, you can't sell it, can't give it to your kids when you die, you'd be like, that's crazy, I own the car. But I have a lease, if I have a lease to a car, then I don't expect I can change the paint color, I don't expect I can give it to my kids when I die. I think that same intuition will carry very naturally into the digital ownership phase of gaming, where if I have a, a fantasy game, I'm not saying free-to-play gaming is going to go away. I'm not saying the digital license is going to go away. But we've already seen a lot of CryptoKitty selling 
uh, kitties for over $100,000, uh, you know, people buying sports teams in our MLB crypto game for $20,000 plus, people paying tens of thousands of dollars in our space game, Crypto Space Commander. We've seen that when you introduce true digital ownership, it unlocks a max value a consumer's willing to pay because, again, much like cars or any other houses, if you're, you're willing to pay more for ownership than leasing. Uh, so that's the element that I'm excited about. And, you know, honestly, I don't even think in 10 years' time the consumer is even going to be referring to it as blockchain gaming or crypto gaming or any of these things. I mean, we, we call our stuff crypto baseball because that's this is where the time, the era we're in. But that's like, uh, you know, I used to call a website a uh, HTTP colon backslash backslash www uh, site. Now if I say I'm going to Forbes, you assume I mean Forbes.com. Um, and I think this is going to be the same thing with digital ownership in games. When people, uh, like your normal non-crypto people are going to be like just understanding, oh, do you own it or do you, are you leasing it? You know, you play Fortnite, you, you love the game, uh, you have this special gun. It, oh, do you own the gun or is it just a lease to use the gun? I don't know what the terminology would be, but it will be something along those lines. Yeah, I think there's two, like, there's two things that Randy was saying. Um, so the first one, in terms of developers versus gamers, um, I think what you're talking about is these evolutionary models. So there's a bunch of experiments going on. So uh, game developers, I think, are going to start moving into the space when uh, they start seeing some of these evolutionary models for some of the earliest pioneers who were in the space um, start being successful in things that they're interested in. And so there's a couple, um, like uh, the the business model uh, that you've got is successful, right? You're sustainable. Um, another one that's really interesting, it's a bit of a, you're in a, we're in a bit of a headwind right now, but it's this new funding, right? Crowdsourced funding. That's an, that's an area where it's really exciting to game developers, but crypto right now has a fairly negative reputation on the gaming side. Um, you know, gamers are cynical uh, anyways, so if they can hate on something, they're gonna hate on it, and right now crypto is hateable, so. Uh, so I think you're going to start seeing some uh, motion, though, when some of the bigger players get into the space. Now, I can't speak for Nintendo or Sony, but Microsoft, from what I understand, they're fairly advanced in terms of what they're working on uh, in the blockchain space. And so they're looking very hard at blockchains. Uh, and they did something very similar with uh, Xbox, because they came from PC. Uh, they actually had a lot of deep experience in multiplayer games and they took all of that experience and put it into their console system and so they got a huge head start uh, in the console space and they were basically I don't want to say they they unseated Nintendo but they gave them a run for the money in the early days and then after that they really accelerated as the quality of their console went up and I think you're gonna see the same thing in the blockchain space um, so that's developers, I think you're gonna see some motion there. And then I just wanted to talk one more thing that, that Randy was saying. You know, we talk about ownership. And game developers, they, they definitely understand, like the, and gamers too, understand uh, ownership in a very specific way, especially around licensing. They kind of don't really get that it is a walled garden that they're participating in. Um, but I think the two things that, that sort of to tack onto that, that I think will really, uh, help both gamers and developers to shift their thinking around blockchains is this idea of experience and expression and that's what you're really looking to do with any digital asset when these conversations come up you know you hear a lot of talk about NFTs and uh, that's non-fungible tokens and the ability to exchange those tokens with your friends or speculate on those tokens to gain some sort of profit but when you look at how gamers really get attached to things, it's really about, it's really about um, their characters. And that's the first thing that they deeply care about. I mean, it's the reason why Fortnite, I think they're at what, a $8 billion company right now. And those are characters that they have, quote unquote, but they are dressing them up in skins, right? This is about expressing who these gamers are as individuals. And so they're willing to uh, spend inordinate amounts of money on that peacocking um, aspect of the game. But there's another thing that they actually do too, and the, where it's very, very lucrative right now for, for Epic. Um, and that's the, the playbooks. So if you guys know how Fortnite works, 
effectively you have these, uh, these books, you go through and you accomplish all these achievements, and then you get awards, and then you get to get little badges that go into your playbook. And kids love this because not only do they get to show, you know, the, the um, sort of creative cosmetic expressions of the character, they can also demonstrate, look what I did, look what I accomplished, and share that story or series of stories with their friends. So when you think about value, that's really what gamers are valuing with their tokens. It's this association of experience and expression. And just to put that in context, <coughs> Fortnite is selling about $300 million a month in, in these skins. Uh, and Christian, I wanted to ask you specifically, can you talk to um, this idea of collectability and being able to trade your assets in, from the point of view of a trading card game? Oh, okay, can I add just one thing? Um, <clears throat> I think for from the player's perspective, uh, I think players don't care about cryptocurrency or 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 blockchain. They they really don't care about it. Uh, they just want better games. They just want different games, new types of games, new types of experience, compelling games. And for from us, from our perspective as developers, uh, building in uh, bl building for blockchain is kind of building for a new console. It's building for a new platform. And we have other types of restrictions, other types of rules in this new console that we are able to build new forms of gaming, new types of game economies. And that is how we are able to make different types of game games that players will be interested in. They will not, players don't, don't don't switch to a new game because of the uh, business model, but you know it's like they they switch because they're they're fun, they're compelling, they're 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 uh, something new. And uh, uh, blockchain, uh, Ethereum, and uh, Bitcoin, and perhaps new inventions that we don't know yet uh, change the rules. And when the rules change, we can make new types of game. Um, uh, I'm sorry, what was your question? So you're building a card game called Dark Winds. Yes. Um, can you talk to the importance of being able to trade and actually own your own cards to, to gamers? Uh, yeah, in the trading card games, uh, are th that's the name. Uh, I think it's a bad irony that in digital trading card games, you cannot trade cards. Uh, so that's a part of uh, the experience, the part of the experience of... Uh, you uh, against others who are building decks. Uh, they they're using their strategies, competing strategies, and you as a strategy builder, you want the best cards, right? And how do you get the best cards? Uh, by trading. Uh, I think it's uh, simple, but uh, this is something that the industry is m really missing. And I think uh, you can find many other examples in MMOs or other types of games where the business model of World Gardens is uh, tainting the game experience because of the restrictions that credit cards impose or the greed of the try to get uh, as much as we can from gamers without uh, uh, when by the restriction of not uh, permitting them to resale their items so I think uh, they have uh, their times are ending and uh, restrictions are lifting and they will have to follow to this new uh, standard that we are making. So I think it's really exciting to be here in this space and uh, talking about this. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I think that, you know, if you look at, you know, the, the digital license was a, is a very convenient thing for the Activisions and the Nintendos of the world because, you know, they, they don't really have to explain why you can't resell your stuff. Uh, you know, even your iTunes collections, when you die, all those songs go back to Apple. They don't have to explain it because there's really never been a concept of digital ownership. So the thing about these types of games is a lot of the value accrues to the players of the games. Uh, in traditional gaming, 100% of the value accrues to the, publish to the uh, developer of the game. You build a game in a sandbox, you put it out, you sell it on a disc for 60 bucks, or you do a free-to-play game. All the revenue goes to um, uh, you know, Clash of Clans or, or King or whoever. Uh, in our games, 
we fully expect it's it's a it, that's the nature of the the blockchain immutable contract we have is that we fully expect there will be secondary markets. So we're essentially competing against our own customers. Not a, not an ideal not an ideal business, but it's also just where things are going to end up. You know, in an ideal world, you control you have a monopoly, you control everything, and you and you are the only one way uh, street selling. In our baseball game, uh, there's a vibrant secondary market on OpenSea, on our own marketplace, and that affects our prices that we can sell stuff at. CryptoKitty is the same thing. Uh, you know, m the majority of the revenue that's flowed through CryptoKitties has not gone to the CryptoKitties developers. And that's fine. That's just the new paradigm we're dealing with here. So I actually think the independent developers will, will rule in this, in this early stage. Again, my you know, experience with the iPhone gaming space is this is an institutional imperative that really fights against the Activisions and the and the um, U Ubisofts and the you know the traditional publishers, and they'll talk about using blockchain and they'll talk about this, but they're probably not going to touch their cash cows, right? Uh, and that's a big opportunity for for developers um, because you know again I, I use crypto as an example. It's actually a pretty simple game mechanic, right? The breeding mechanic's been around since you know the 80s. If you were to put that game up on a database and just say, here's a breeding game, nobody would have been interested. It was the fact that you could breed and sell your cats that added a whole new dimension to the game. So now you take that simple example and you go and look at all the simple games that have been invented for the last 30 years. And you say, wow, if I added digital ownership to that, does that make that game more fun? Pac-Man? Probably not. Um, Zelda? Yeah, that would probably be more fun with digital ownership. Uh, so I think that's a good way of looking at it. And just to kind of paint a picture, Hearthstone, which is the largest digital trading card game, 15 million plus monthly active users, cost about $200 a year to stay competitive. You're taking 100% loss as a player when you spend those $200 a year. You cannot transfer your cards. You cannot monetize that time unless you're the top you know, 1% who makes it to the, the tournaments uh, at the top. So this is, a, you know, this is revolutionary to be able to play all night on a Friday night and then on Saturday, uh, you know, take your girlfriend out to dinner because you sold a rare item in a game. I'll add just one more element to this. This concept of, a, of, of a, a real money economy around a game is not a new concept. It's been tried several times. Uh, Diablo 3 had a real money economy. World of Warcraft had several gray market economies. A lot of the early crypto people were actually old World of Warcraft gray market economy people. Um, the problem is What's happened historically is the developer or the publisher does what they call nerfing. Nerfing is where you take a good gun and you reduce its stats or you change its rules so you can't use it anymore. And so Diablo 3 just shut down the real, market, the real money marketplace because they got pressure from a lot of their players that didn't like it. That was a business decision. I understand why they did it. They did it to please their players, maximize their profit. They had a legacy of Diablo 1 and Diablo 2 they had to, to live with. When, when a game creates... Uh, NFTs or, or fungible tokens in their game for that matter, you can't turn those off. You, you are making, you are inherently saying this is a feature of the game. If the users complain, it doesn't matter. You can't, you can't undo it. We can never stop somebody from selling our, our, our players in our baseball game. And that becomes a feature of the game. Um, and so, you know, even if, even if a game that has a central server type of, you know, a a Forza Motorsports says, hey, we're going to have a secondary market economy. You never really know if Microsoft might change the rules on you in five or ten years. Uh, and then that inherently puts a cap on how much those items can ever be worth as collectibles. So uh, switching gears, Randy, you had one of the most mainstream partnerships the past few months with the MLB. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about and you know, how long did it take to, to convince them of the benefits to really try this? Yeah, I mean, out, out of all the sort of AAA licensors in the world, MLB's uh, one of the most uh, progressive, uh, you know, versus the other sports leagues, versus, you know, movie studios and whatnot. Uh, when, we, when we decided to get into this, um, you know, we, we said we wanted to do something around collecting. This is before CryptoKitties, uh, so there was no, there was no ERC-721 standard. Uh, we just looked at blockchain as this, you know, new way of creating digital scarcity, and we wanted to get into you know, collecting and, and invented game. We didn't really know what it was going to look like at the time. We decided we'd go out to sort of a short list of our top licensors. Uh, we were, my partner and I were children of the 80s, so we remember peak baseball card, garbage pail kid collecting. Uh, kids don't want physical tchotchkes anymore. They don't want physical crap. Uh, my, bi my business partner has a, a good story when he goes to Dodger Stadium and he gets a Sandy Koufax coin and gives it to his 16-year-old kid. His kid just gives it back to him and says, I don't want it, even though that thing could be sold for 50 bucks on eBay. So 
you know, we approached MLB and we you know, explained to them what Bitcoin we talked to them about. And they, they were familiar. They had really looked into a lot of blockchain stuff, uh, you know, for ticketing. And, you know, you're, you're at an investor conference. There's a, a thousand things that can be that they will be pitching a, a large multi-billion dollar organization like MLB. And collecting really struck at their, like they got that right away because it's a quintessential collector's brand. I mean, if, you, if you're explaining Bitcoin or CryptoKitty to my mom, you will inevitably invoke the term you know, baseball cards. You'll say, it's like baseball cards. There's scarcity, there's only a certain number of them. Uh, and people get that right away. So we thought baseball was perfect. Um, the other really cool thing about, about a sport is that uh, you don't have to kind of come up with the artwork or the, 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 what makes it special because every year there's something magnificent that happens in, in sports that uh, can be memorialized in collectibles. So in that sense, we really like the idea of, of uh, you know, as opposed to, you know, trying to come up with the next uh, beautiful artwork or the next beautiful uh, Crypto Kitty style game. Uh, sports sort of writes its own narrative. And then the process of licensing was just, a, it's a regular license. I mean, it's its just like you would get a license for uh, an iOS app. Um, obviously, uh, it's a lot more complicated from a, you know, legal and technology because it's new with blockchain but it's, this is all pretty straightforward stuff it's, I mean when you really boil it down to it what we're doing is not really that uh, it's it, to me it's actually the most intuitive use of blockchain uh, the collectible space um, you know Bitcoin with money that makes sense to me uh, there's a lot of things I hear in the sort of ICO space doesn't always make sense to me collectibles is actually pretty straightforward it's there's a digital item it's you know it's it's, it's your Mike Trout Card, your Mike Trout statuette. Uh, Dodgers are in the World Series. If the Dodgers win the World Series, and there's a set of collectibles associated with that, there will be somebody in the world who will value that. And and so that was that. that that's how it came about. And um, you know, we're really excited about it. We think it has uh, uh, applications in stadium giveaways. We did this giveaway at Dodger Stadium, getting you know, giving people who are not crypto enthusiasts their first crypto. Uh, through something that they actually care about, which is the the Dodgers. Um, so, so it sounds like it took over a year, or about uh, a year. Yeah, no, it, it took over a year. Uh, you know, when you know we we started talking to them, Crypto Kitties kind of came came around through the process. The ERC seven twenty one standard came in. Everything coalesced uh, uh, in a, in a nice way through the process. But yeah, it took over a year, and and uh, and again, I I I, it, I hope this breaks open the door for other licenses because I think that. You know where digital collecting becomes a lot more interesting is with brands with affinity. Uh, you know, if people care about Avengers, people care about Marvel. Nobody care like your average consumer really doesn't care about EOS versus Tether versus Ethereum. That's not the where the average consumer's at. Uh, the average consumer has the brands that they love, um, and I think gaming is a nice way of bringing that all together. And they definitely don't care if it's so hard to actually get to the experience in the first place, yes. right? So user onboarding is kind of, I'm going to go ahead and say, it, probably our biggest problem right now um, to getting towards this next level of mainstream adoption. So can you guys talk a little bit about how you guys are approaching user onboarding with your games? Okay, uh, so, so what, what we see is that if I put you in a dark room uh, for a number of hours, then uh, you, when you go out, you'll be blind, right? So we think players now are blind because they've been in the dark room for so many years. So uh, it's not a good time to uh, try to expect too much of the audience that we're talking to. Uh, s but in the long term, I think maybe in, in 10 years or maybe less, it will be common sense for players that are spending money inside a virtual world to be spending cryptocurrency. It will be the natural thing to do. And they will demand that the stuff that they're buying is a crypto collectible. So, and, and crypto collectibles are not the only thing about crypto in gaming. If you think about technology like uh, uh, the Lightning Network for Bitcoin, which is just starting out, it's fantastic because if I want to build an MMO with credit cards, it's such a 
difficult thing to do, and it's only for the big players who have time for compliance and make a big deal. Or you want, uh, or if you don't want to go that route, you have to uh, use uh, Google or Apple payments that will take 20%. Or if you think about uh, doing stuff like using Stripe, that if you charge one dollar for an item using Stripe, they will take 30 cents as a fixed fee, then when they will take a uh, percentage of that transaction, you will end up with one third of the total transaction for charging one dollar. Uh, using a Lightning Network in Bitcoin allows you to make, uh, uh, allows players to make payments as low as 10 cents without commission. Uh, and sometimes, some collectible items uh, have that price. Uh, so, uh, I think in the long term, this, these technologies are just starting out. People don't understand the gas price. The gas price is not calculated accordingly sometimes, and uh, there's just too much confusion, too much blindness. And I think this is something for companies to look uh, um, for five years at least. So that's how we approach these things, uh, building the best game we can make and uh, not expecting anything soon. I, I think there's a lot of companies that are skating towards this solution at the same time, you know, between Coinbase and the CryptoKitties guys and us and these guys. Um, I think we will be providing this stuff for sale. Like this year, this year with between CryptoKitties and our games, it's all about going to Coinbase, get your Ethereum, put it in MetaMask, go through. It's you know it's a 15-step process that it's just not ready for prime time, uh, but that's fine. I mean, it's an, this is early adopter. This is like pre pre Netscape Internet is how I like to describe it. It's like you can get on it and you'll have some fun, but it's it's you know wait till Netscape kicks in and then boom, it's off to the races. And you know I don't know like. Like I don't, we'll, we're gonna sell our stuff in whatever format people want to buy it. If they want to buy it with fiat, I'm gonna sell it to them in fiat. If they want to buy it with Ethereum. They want to buy it with Bitcoin. Uh, so I'm not so like like right now. This is a crypto product for crypto people. That's how that's how all this stuff is. Uh, for us as a company, next year it is a it is a product for baseball fans. So this year it was a, a product for baseball fans who also are Ethereum slash crypto fans. Next year it's a product for baseball fans because I I do believe for this to go outside of you know these ha these halls, it is it is not what plasma sidechain are you on, what blockchain are you on, what lightning network you on. For the average consumer, it's just can I sell it? Like is this something that I own that I can actually sell? Um, so that's where that's where we're at, sort of. And we're all gonna, but we're all gonna evolve and do whatever makes our businesses successful. So we're, I'm open to changing my opinion at any given moment uh, over the next year. I think we we found that we hit this kind of weird spot. So like Christian's talking about, you know, you wanna you wanna be careful about this bright light for for gamers, but also on the crypto side, we found that with uh, Alien Arsenal. So we what do we do? We we try to figure out where the friction points were. So it is the wallet, it's getting into crypto, right? You have to deal with exchanges and then tokens. And then on top of that, there's plugins that you have to use. And so we just sort of looked at those and, and tried to figure out, well, what are the big ones that we gotta get rid of? So we, we let people have a wallet. As soon as they download the app, you get a wallet. We give you some of our tokens uh, as a part of our space drop because they're aliens. It's actually an airdrop and then also uh, you have the ability to get your um, digital assets, which are in, come in the form of aliens. So all this happens sort of right there for you. And we got folks on the crypto side who are like, "What the? Uh, where's? How do I get my tokens?" We're like, "Well, we gave them to you. You don't. Well, where's the plug? Where's the plug-in go? Well, you don't need one." So, so there's kind of this fine line that you have to figure out. And I think we could have benefited from more user testing on the crypto side. We were kind of building for gamers. So but that's where you want to fall into an error, I suppose, if you're going to make a mistake. Uh, but the second part is that on the, on the gamer side, uh, we didn't do enough to make things smooth. Um, so th it is, it is uh, difficult to uh, tell gamers why they should care about crypto. And that's sort of the big lesson that we took away from it. Um, but 
you know, that that's sort of the first start. And I think we heard today uh, from Adam Draper, him talking about iteration and how crucial that is. That is something that you have to bake into your development process. And so you can learn from mistakes like that, iterate, and then do better the next time. And so I think that that's, that's sort of the two pieces that we're thinking about when we think about how to solve some of the user experience usability problem, uh, as well as user education. So it's just a matter of keep in touch with your users. Um, and I think Steve Wozniak was talking about that too. It's focus on the use and the, the, the things that you need to fix will percolate up because the people who are using it are gonna tell you. Do we have time for a question or two? Any questions in the audience? Okay, uh, you right here. I mean, for them be cheaper to mint, <laughs> you know, if they were, if you could, yeah, if you could kind of do a, a, a large, you know, kind of batch mint. When we did the 40,000 um, uh, giveaway at Dodger Stadium, we, uh, I think, took over, you know, 25% of the Ethereum gas over that time, and it took much longer. It was much more challenging than we thought it was going to be. Um, doing 40,000 of anything is a lot, and um, so... It would be nice if there was sort of better, a better way to just do that. Um, yeah, they were all all the the private keys were on each card below beneath the scratch code. I would say uh, layer one scaling solutions, so not having to rely on side chains always to be able to scale on Ethereum mainnet. Well, there's there's also a, I think gas estimation is still experimental and uh, difficult to understand. I'm not sure if it's being done right at this moment uh, because uh, uh, I don't know I think it, there's space for uh, introduction of new algorithms for uh, gas estimation. A lot of card generation that we have with with players uh, they get canceled out or they pay too much or too little, uh, and uh, it's difficult to know uh, exactly how much gas are you, are you going to pay. Yeah, we have a, a second game called Crypto Space Commander. Uh, so, you know, MLB Crypto Baseball, it's a collecting game. Uh, it's based on the, the events of the game, but it's really a collecting game. Our other game, Crypto Space Commander, is like EVE Online. Uh, so if you're familiar with EVE Online, it's a user-controlled uh, space MMO. Uh, one of the longest running. It's, it's, it's a very niche category, but the fandom is deep, very deep. Uh, so Crypto Space Commander um, has, you know, something like 10,000 people in the Discord, uh, you know, a, a very large fandom around it. And the idea is that you fly to a planet, mine your resources, look for crafting recipes, improve your ship, fly to a further planet. You're dealing with space, so you have the entire uh, universe to expand the game. Uh, so that is very much a, uh, a crafting RPG uh, style, which I think crafting RPGs is a very uh, good category, along with card battling games, a good category for, uh, for blockchain gaming. And if you think about it, gamers like to send money to each other. Uh, it, like, uh, if you have a streaming, uh, uh, if you, you th there's people sending you money by, via tips. And uh, wouldn't it be cool that if you're in MMO and you find someone who is super fun or, 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 or a good player that you can send money to inside the game? That is actually not possible in these modern MMOs. So uh, you can see uh, in Patreon, in Twitch, that players are uh, sending money to each other. And it's something they, they, they are do doing now. And they will do more if uh, they could do it inside the game, not using these web platforms. Yeah, I, I have to apologize to everybody. I totally buried the lead. So one of the things that we're w also working on is this development um, towards the manufacturing of the metaverse. And this was something that you, 
you couldn't really, and for those that don't know, so if you read a lot of Neil Stevenson or um, you know a lot of uh, cyberpunk, you've got William Gibson. So this is digital landscape, uh, and and so you could never really do the metaverse before blockchains, uh, and that's because what the what the blockchains do is they're actually like a external database, and so you can put stuff in this database that's persistent, and then something really cool happens. Uh, once you do that, the games start becoming lenses through which you look at these assets on the blockchain. And so the, the, the assets begin to link the games together. And so for Alien Arsenal, uh, you, we could say, uh, have planets. And these planets can also exist in Project Genesis, the same planet. Then on top of that, you could have that in our, we've got a, a partner um, title called Mankind Reborn, that's a cyberpunk MMO, and so those planets can exist in the MMO. So when you're talking about economies and EVE Online caliber games, absolutely. Like, that's one of the things that blockchains and games really are going to allow people to explore with and experiment with. Incredible economic models, not just finance, uh, but also governance. And we talk a lot about the power of governance for blockchains or from blockchains. You can try out these models in games and that's really what games are for, right? That's, that's why we play as a species and that's why the drive transcends our species. You see it in, you know, corvids or crows and obviously anybody who's got a dog or a cat, they play. It's a le it, it, play is something that lets you experiment in a non-lethal and non-harmful way. And so, this is a great environment to try all of these things. And if you can create a, a digital landscape in which you can try these models without like severe economic consequence in the game space, you can then see what percolates out that you might be able to use in, in meat space. Yeah. All right, I think we're almost out of time. I want to give you guys one last chance to plug your games. So Dark Winds, when can the public play? They can play now. Uh, version 1.0 is uh, will be out on Halloween, uh, but you can try the beta right now. And uh, yeah, you can buy your cards and first edition cards for now. And uh, but we are preparing for second edition and to announce very soon. Project Genesis. Uh, yep, Project Genesis. We're going to be in alpha probably the second quarter. So what would that be? Winter. 2019 um, or is that summer that's summer sorry summer 2019 but if you wanted to check out some of our um, forays into user experience you can download alien arsenal on the app store or play store get your free uh, five eight-bit tokens um, that won't be lasting much longer so hurry up and get in um, yeah I think that's it uh, MLB crypto baseball dot com is a, a baseball game uh, Babe Ruth's up for sale right now if anybody likes wants a true historical figure. Uh, and our Crypto Space Commander is uh, EVE Online style Diablo 3 top-down 2.5D uh, uh, graphics. Uh, kind of a, imagine EVE Online, but you can play it on your iPad, iPhone, uh, and PC. Uh, it will be a native install. It will not be a MetaMask uh, browser-based game. Uh, so again, it's, it's niche, but if you're a fan of space MMOs, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. All right. Thank you, everyone. If you have more questions, just come talk to them after this.